Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second session today of Learning Data Live 2020. I'm Alan Pringle of Scriptorium, and I'll be moderating this session. This session is Release Notes, Transform JIRA Queries into Data Reports. LearningData.com and Learning Data Live are brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. If you're trying to figure out how the DITA model will best support your content, or if you're configuring DITA systems, please contact us. We'd love to work with you. LearningDITA.com and LearningDITA Live would not be possible without the help from our sponsors, and we thank them very much for their support. I want to tell you a little bit about how this session is going to work. During the webcast, all attendees are muted. However, we do want your feedback and questions. If you would, take the time and look in the GoToWebinar interface for the chat module. You can send questions to us through that. And at the end of the session, we will have a question and answer session. So send the questions in whenever and I will read them to our presenter at the end and get them answered. Also, at the end of the session, we will drop some links into the chat module. One of those links will be to a survey. We very much want your feedback on this session and the event. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to our presenter. Chris, are you there? I am here. Great, let me hand over presenting to you. I'm looking. There you go. Um, okay, there it is. Show my main screen, yes. Let me hide that. Let me bring this over. And let's go into slideshow mode. There you go. Okay. All right, so hello everybody. I hope you're ready to, oops. I hope you're ready to look at um, JIRA and look at how JIRA can be um, integrated with uh, DITA workflow so that you can um, maybe streamline your, your uh, release note um, process. Um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Despopoulos. I'm the Publications Manager at Turbonomic Incorporated. Um, you have my email address. Um, and, and after this session, if any of these scripts or anything that I've shown you is, seems interesting to you, please feel free to contact me. I can send you um, any, any of the scripts that I'll be showing here today. Um, a little of, of my background, I've been working in tech pubs for a long time. Um, I spent a long time working as a FrameMaker plugin developer under the name of Cudspan. Um, in the last eight years, I've been working at Turbonomic. Um, and in, in, in that role, um, I've gone through migrating content to DITA. We implemented our own online help system that actually uh, transforms DITA to HTML in the browser, kind of on the fly. Um, we use DITA to solve a lot of rebranding problems and, and filtering content for customer roles. And um, we use DITA to publish our release notes. Um, I, I do want to say, if, um, I don't know the range of expertise um, for people listening, but I'm not by, I wouldn't consider myself a DITA expert per se. I consider myself more of a do-it-yourself kind of hack person who uses DITA to hopefully save a little time and maybe save a little money. That's that's my experience with the technology. Um, before I go on, I'd like to just um, give a word from my sponsor, which is Turbonomic. Um, we uh, perform application resource management so what we do um, is, is we analyze your um, IT environment. And um, if you're running on virtual machines, if you're running on 
on, on the cloud. We analyze your environment and, and keep it healthy, keep all the applications running with the resources that they need, but without um, using too many resources. So the idea is that you get um, customer satisfaction and you don't waste money. Um, if if you ever run into um, if if you speak with people in your in your enterprise and and they are talking about IT problems, maybe you think about us and and ask them to take a look at our website. Um, okay, so with that, I'll move on. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to have an understanding of um, who's participating in this session. So, um, Alan. Can you um, can you uh, run the polls? I have Absolutely. two questions to ask. And here comes the first poll. So please select the answer on your screen. And I'll keep that poll up for about 30 seconds. Let's see. We've got a few votes in. Anybody else? We're about at 62%. And it looks like we've about hit that threshold. 6% um, are the first, what is DITA, followed by 31%, which is the highest amount. They're learning DITA, but they're not using it. 28% are learning DITA, using it as an author. 28% are learning data and managing it uh, in their production flow, and then 6% say they are experts. And I'm going to close the poll now. So there you go. Okay, and then was there another poll for XSLT? Yes, I can run that one as well too. Okay. okay. Here's the second poll. Choose the item that best describes your most advanced experience with XSLT. I'll wait a little bit longer on this one. So please vote if you haven't. Okay, by far 43% for the first one, what is XSLT? And then it's the upper teens for the next three options. So your audience, uh, almost half is what is XSLT. Okay. Okay. And I'll close the poll now. All righty, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now um, so now let's talk a little bit about this um, presentation. Um, I'm actually going to be looking at XSLT, so I guess for the major uh, close to the majority, certainly half half of us, um, we're going to be getting a look at XSLT. Um, We'll even see a little bit about what it looks like. I'm not going to teach anybody how to write XSLT scripts. I think the idea is better to think what can I, what can we achieve with XSLT? Um, one of the one of the great things about XML in general and and Dita specifically is that um, your content is in a format that you can process. And um, sometimes this processing can be very useful. It can set up uh, workflows that save you a lot of time, that um, improve the quality of your, of your output. And, and um, this example of using, of using DITA to produce release notes 
is an example of a process that um, tries to streamline as much as possible. So now, um, I guess for people who are novices, I guess what's interest, interesting about this is just um, kind of seeing just a, a, another, ha having another take on how um, this kind of technology can be put to work for you. Um, for, for people who are authors who, who use DITA a lot, um, I guess what I'd really like you to come away with is, is some sense of, of evaluating your own workflows and, and looking for things that maybe could be automated, things that could be streamlined, things that could be easier for you to do. And, and, and believing that if you can imagine that the technology can, can help you in some way, can, can streamline and it can, can improve your, um, can improve your quality of life. Well, if, if you can imagine it, then it can probably be done. Um, and then, well, I guess we're not going to have a lot of people who really implement, um, implement XSLT scripts, but um, I guess one thing that we'll see is that um, JIRA is its own thing. And to be able to integrate JIRA with a, a workflow, you have to understand something about JIRA as well. Um, so, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that this presentation will be useful for everybody. Now, um, kind of before moving on, um, you kind of have to ask the question, why am I making release notes? That, that's got to drive um, everything that you do. For us, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, our customers demand the release notes and they wanna know why they're gonna to update to this particular version. They kind of want help in planning how they're going to um, deploy an update. And also a lot of our customers have legal requirements that they must uh, show that they did due diligence before um, deploying our product. And the release notes are a part of that. So to, to satisfy those needs, we have certain requirements in our release notes. Um, we, we, must put them, we must produce them in PDF. Um, we are also working toward an HTML delivery. Um, they need to have certain boilerplate in them, um, you know, the introduction and certain requirements and recommendations that 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 they have to take that customers have to take into account. Um, we also need to have specific categories. Um, you can't just have a jumble of issues all thrown thrown out. In, in, in a row, we, we divide them up into improvements, fixed issues, and known issues. Um, we have a requirement for rich content. If you look on the right, um, that is a single known issue. And I hope you can appreciate that if this was just written in plain text, if we didn't have the benefit of bolding, the benefit of, of typography in the content, uh, the benefit of lists that it would be a lot harder to read and and so we need to be able to support this kind of uh, rich content um, this usually can't be found in a, in a bug database but um, we found a way to do this and then finally we need some reuse um, we put out a, a special version that's internal only um, only pe um, employees can see that version, and it's got a lot of extra content. That content comes across in, in italic text, so people know what's internal only. Um, we also um, have OEM customers, and they need release notes. They need the same release notes, but they need um, uh, the, the product name is different. Uh, maybe we have some content that links to our website, and we need to hide that from the OEM customers. So we need um, what FrameMaker refers to as uh, conditional text that's kind of based on these OEM versions as well. And then finally, it's hard work to do this. And we've got a very ambitious um, release cycle. Every two weeks, we put out a new um, update. Um, we've got three different flavors of the product. We've got, um, we call them classic, XL and 
SaaS for software as a service, but there, there are three flavors of the product. And then also the OEM releases are on a different cadence. So we need to be able to, we need some agility in, in the way we uh, produce our release notes. We, we're a small team and we don't, we, we can't devote one person to nothing but release notes. So if you've been attending the, um, the, if you've been attending these sessions up to now, then I hope that you can see how Ditto um, can, can support all these requirements. And then for us, it's, it's obvious because we already use Ditto for our technical content anyway. So it makes sense to um, try and do this. So now, um, when you produce release notes, you can think of it in, um, in different steps. And the question that you have to ask is, what can, what can you streamline? So um, we, we look at um, the first step that we wanted to streamline is identifying the issues. Um, we're, a start, we, we be, we're a startup, we began as a very small startup. We didn't, um, at first, we didn't produce any release notes. Then when we started producing release notes, we had a triage team that would sit down and decide which issues should, belong, should go into a release note. And, and that be, became unsustainable. And so, of course, we want to use criteria in the bug database and, and use that. Um, now, when you're organizing your release notes, um, again, should you have to read through the release note and, and, and remember that this is an improvement versus a known issue and so forth, or can you just use fields in the database to keep track of it? It's much easier to use the database to keep track of that. And then when it's time to produce the document, um, what we found is that we can store the release note description in the issue um, as data, and then we can generate the data output from our JIRA database, and then we can use our standard data tools to produce our release note document. So it comes down to being able to streamline um, almost everything, but you can't streamline the actual writing. Um, writing is the hard work, and, and the goal is to make it so that you have time to do the hard work and let machines do the easy work for you. So I want to talk a little bit about JIRA. Um, the first thing is um, when when we started to do this, we we didn't have the 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 mandate to ask the company to redesign the JIRA database so that it could solve all our needs. We were only given two fields. And so we have to use those fields and, and get the most that we can out of that. Now, um, JIRA will save a query out as XML. And once you save something out as XML, that means that you can transform it into other XML. Um, and now an important point to keep in mind is that every JIRA deployment is different. Um, our, our JIRA deployment is not going to look like yours if you have a JIRA deployment. And, and so this can be an example, but you can't do what we're doing for data. Now, um, for producing our documentation, we currently use Oxygen. Um, we're a very small team. So um, if we have to reconfigure Oxygen to, to um, address a new uh, or, 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 or to give us a new output based on some changes in our handling of the release notes. Well, we can do that. We just have to, have to sit down and say, okay, we're going to make this change and, and everybody is on board. Um, we run our transforms through the product. It, it's got a user interface for doing that. Um, the, the project keeps your files in order. Um, we can run other scripts, it turns out that the JIRA output needs to be cleaned up and, and we can run other scripts. But I do want to stress one thing, and that is that Oxygen is not a requirement for doing something like this. The whole point of DITA is that it's tool agnostic. Um, when we began, we used FrameMaker and we switched over to Oxygen midstream, if you will. No problem as far as that goes. Okay, now um, we use JIRA 
um, like this. We have two fields. One is the release note category, and that stores metadata about the release note. So we know the category of it, is it a fixed issue, a known issue? And we also can store um, a string in there, different, different, different text in that field that tells us whether we need to make an issue internal only, whether we need to make the issue, whether we need to hide the issue from the OEM customers, things like that. And then the other field that we have is the release notes field, and that's where the actual description goes. We're gonna transform every issue into an, a, an LI element that if you know your HTML, there's a UL, which is an unordered list, and then each item in the unordered list is an LI. And Ditto does the same thing, and, and that's, that's what we're going to have to contain each issue that, that we're printing out. Now we use queries and, and um, we query against two things. Well, I mean, fundamentally we query against two things. One is whether the customer is identified in this bug. And that means, has the customer seen this given issue? And then the other is the release note category because we'll get individual queries for each category. And then we'll export each query to XML and we'll transform each query to a different package. So um, in the release note category field, what sort what do we do? We we use special naming. And um, uh, so for example, improvement or known issue or note, those are the three categories that we put in the release note category field. But then we can also add turbonomic only, and that says that this is not going to be visible to an OEM customer. And, or we can say internal, and that says this is um, only for our employees to see. So now with, with queries, we can get all the note issues that are um, not classic. So classic is one of the flavors of our product. Or we can get all improvements that are not XL or SAS. XL and SAS, again, are two of the flavors of our product. So, so that way our queries can, can get just the issues that are necessary for a given release. And then when we um, transform the query, then we use internal or turbonomic only to determine the audience. When you set an audience in DITA, then you can use um, the open toolkit to hide any content that has an audience of internal, for example. And that's what we'll do um, with this information that's in the release note category field. Now in the release notes field itself, it just contains the data. If you remember that, um, that rich text example for, for a, a known issue, um, that's on the right and on the left is what it looks like in the in in the actual field in the Jira database, um, it's just any data that is valid within a list item. Um, yes, and then and then finally, after we've gone through the query, and um, what we do is is um, we provide this release note content. And when we're through with all of the query and we know that we have the correct content for every issue, we know that we have the correct category for every issue, then we export the query as XML. So now um, what we do with this in Oxygen is um, to transform the queries into data topics. Again, it's, a, it's one, um, one uh, topic for each query. And then we have an external tool that we run that cleans up the transformed content. Um, it, it turn, it, so Jira, when you save as XML, if the, if the release note field has the angle brackets in it for um, XML, it turns those into entity wraps. So 
where you might put an angle bracket to P close angle bracket, then the um, saved the the XML that um, Jira saved puts it out as as ampersand less than P ampersand greater than, and so we have to transfer tra uh, we have to change all of these into the angle brackets. And and once we as, and that comes after we have made our transform, and then once we do that, then we generate our PDF output. We uh, just run a book map through oxygen, and and we get our, our PDF. And so now, this is where we're going to start looking at the XSLT. Um, I guess fasten your seatbelts. Um, uh, let's hope it's not too bumpy of a ride. Um, we have a, a, we have wrapper transform files that we use to start each transform. So um, we have a if we have an improve if we made an export and uh, if we made a query for improvements, we save it as XML, then we'll run it through the improvements um, wrapper. And the same thing if it's fixed issues, we run it through the fixed issues wrapper. And the same thing for known issues. And those begin the transform. And then they use a, a fourth file, which is our, our base transform. This will make more sense as we move forward. And in the end, then we get our data topics. So what does the wrapper transform look like? Um, I'll try and walk through this in, in a sensible way for everybody. Um, in, in the JIRA XML, the query is put into a channel element. So the first thing that XSL, the XSLT does is it finds, it, it reads that file. And when it finds the channel element, it creates an element named topic. So that's the first thing we're going to do. We match channel and we begin a data topic. Now, the next thing that we do is um, make this into a, a valid um, data topic. A data topic must have an ID and it must have a title and it must have a body. So now, assuming we're running the transform for fish, fixed issues, the first thing we do is we give it an ID and a title. So for the ID, we just make it fixed issues. And then for the title, we also say this is fixed issues. Then we create the body element, and that's here. And then we create the UL element, and then we apply all further templates. So maybe a word of explanation. The idea of XSLT, the idea of a transform, and, and actually, I think anybody who has created a PDF or an HTML file out of JITA has already run transforms, and they use XSLT to, to do that. The idea of a transform is that it reads an XML file, and for every element in that file, it then perform some transformation. And in this case, our transformation is to take a channel element and turn it into a topic element. And then if we're going to make a topic element, since we know we're making DITA, we're going to make it into a valid topic element. And so the XSLP script just has instructions to make the attribute for fixed issues, an instruction to make the title and give it text, which is fixed issue, an instruction to create the body, and the instruction to create the unorganized list. And then finally, what we do is we include the uh, Jira to Dita base XSL file, the base transform. And that is what's going to create all the all the lists um, items. 
So remember, we've got these wrapper transforms, and then they're going to use the base transform. So that's what comes next. Now, this is more complicated, so hold on. Um, the, the base transform does four fundamental things, okay? It's going to create the list item. It's going to um, make a link to the item, to the, to the actual JIRA issue, so that our employees, when they're reading these release notes, our employees, can just link on, I uh, can just click the link, open the issue and see the whole history of that issue. We also put a fixed uh, version in, into the content because the people in the field asked for that. And then we put the content into the, the list item. Now, the way we're gonna do this, if we, if we, look, at the, if we look at the code on the right, you can, you can see that these are uh, four separate um, XSL templates. And the first template is going to create the list item. It's going to set the ID to be the issue number. And then it's going to look at the release note category field and decide if it needs to set the audience attribute. And that's gonna be a few steps that we're gonna have to go through. Then for the key, we just have to create the link. There's a lot of them. You'll, you'll see how that works. It's not too frightening. Then for the fixed version, that's very simple. We just get the content of a field and put it into our, our document. And then finally, to get the, um, to get the release notes um, content, we put that into the list item as well. All right, so to create the list item, the first step is to open the list item element and we'll give it an ID. And the reason we're giving it an ID is because we can use that to have cross references in our release notes. So if we have one known issue that is related to a fixed issue, then we can have cross references between them. And, and we use this ID in order to make that possible. Um, and we just use the issue number, and that's in the uh, JIRA's key element. So what do we do? In our XSL, we find an item. This item, remember, we are in the channel, and now in the channel, the channel in JIRA contains a number of items. So we're going to find every item, and for every item, we're going to make an element named LI, and for every LI element, we're going to give it an ID. And that ID is going to come from the key field that is within this item. And now um, we have to get the, the content out of the release note category field. And we're going to put that into a variable because we're going to use that in order to set um, the audience. Again, this is so we can hide internal uh, issues from customers and so that we can hide turbonomic issues from um, OEM customers. Now, this, the, the top, this, this top bit of, of code is what the, is, is what the release note category field looks like in the JIRA. So it is a custom field and it's got a custom field name. And then every custom field has custom field values. And this particular one has a single value. And in this one, it is note internal. So we know that this is a note. And we also know that we want to hide this from customers. Okay, so to, to get this into a variable, um, we use the XSL command, um, instruction to create a variable that we name field content. And then we select from the, um, from the 
from the entry that we're in, we select the custom field that has the name, release no category, and we get the next sibling, which is custom field values, and we get the custom field value from that, and we get the text from that. I know this is this seems very arcane, but um, the idea now is that we have a variable and it says note internal, and we can use that now to set the audience. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to try and walk through everything here. In XSL, there is a concept of choose, and that's like in any other programming where you say if, then, else. And, and so what we're choosing is if the variable has a certain value in it, then we're going to set an attribute. So let's just look at the last one. So we're saying when field content contains internal, then we're going to create an attribute of, and the attribute, it's going to be an audience attribute and the value is going to be internal. So this is, this, this, um, this list item is going to have an audience of internal. And we're also then going to follow it up with a paragraph that says, internal only. And then when we're done with that, we'll just um, go on, we'll, we'll get the release note content and, and, um, and, and everything else that needs to go in the list item, and then we'll be done with this item. So assuming, assuming that, that we had um, turbonomic only, then this is what the end result would be. The end result so far is that we have a list item, we have an ID, which is based on the key, and we have an audience equals turbonomic, or it could be an audience equals internal. We have an audience that's based on what was in the, um, the release no category field. So the next thing that we're creating is the link to the JIRA issue. And we're matching the key from the JIRA ticket, and we're just building an, uh, an extra. This, I'm not going to walk through all of this XML, XSLT here because in one sense, it's very standard, but in another sense, um, if, if you're not, familiar with XSLT, just looking at all these could make your eyes roll back in your head. The bottom, the end result is that we create this cross-reference. We've got an href attribute. Every cross-reference in data needs an href. And, and this href then is to our um, JIRA implementation. Every JIRA implementation has a different URL. And if you just put a forward slash and the, the, the ticket number on it, then that is enough to link to the ticket and open it. And we set the scope to external, we set the format to HTML, and then we put this, uh, we, we put the same key as the content, as the, as, as the text that you click on. And of course, the audience for this paragraph is internal, so only our employees can see this link. But this then is a link that everybody can use to click and go to the actual issue. Now we do something similar to get the fixed version. Um, it's a lot simpler because we're not creating a link. Um, we create an element. We give it an audience of internal. And then we say the fixed version is the value of the fixed version field. Whenever we find a fixed, whenever the XSLT encounters a fixed version field, this is what we create. 
And so at the bottom here, we see the sample result of that. Um, in this case, um, there was a fixed version of 7.21.0 in the field, and this is what we produce. And now we finally come to getting the release note content into the list item. And, and um, again, this is, well, if, if you look up, up above, this is what the release note field looks like in the JIRA XML. It's a custom field. It's got a name of release note. It's got a single value and it's got this content with these entity refs in it. So we matched the custom field named release note and we get the value of the custom field value and that's it. Um, we have the um, we we have the content in our in our list item. So now this is what the whole thing looks like when it's done. We have a list item, we have an ID, we have an audience of turbonomics. We have a paragraph with an audience of internal, and it's got a link to the um, to it's got a link to the Jira ticket item. We have a paragraph with audience internal, and it's got the fixed version. And then we've got the content of the of of the um, release note description. So then we just have to run a script that we have over this result. The, what this script does is it takes the encodings and turns them into regular characters. Now we're on, uh, we, we use Macintoshes and so we can use a bash script. The, um, you can also use um, different tools in Windows. I haven't tried them out, but it's a script that that performs these changes to the text and the end result is to go from from what's above to what's below so then the next step is after we've transformed all the queries we um we generate the book if you need to modify the boilerplate or anything like that we go ahead you go ahead and do it you generate the book and then you've got pdf to send now this all looked really spooky and scary i'm sure i'd like to actually show um what it's like to do this um so i'm going to well hang on i can just put this over so um here is here is a um, here is a query for improvements, and it's it's a query for all the improvements that were fixed in 6.4.12, and were not also fixed in earlier versions. It's not XL, and it's not pending, and it's not been archived. It's just an improvement. So we have three improvements here. And you can see that um, I've, I've got um, I've got the the content is written into the um, is is written in the issue as data. Okay, so I'm going to export this as XML. I'll open it in a new tab. And this is what it looks like at that point. But I'm going to save this file and I'll save it in my in my location where I keep all of my release note work. Now I'm, I'm just going to save it out as Jira out demo. And I'll save that. I already had this out so 
Okay, so now let's see what we can do with that. I'm, I'm, I'm in oxygen now. I want to refresh my view just to make sure I get the latest of everything. And I have Jira out demo. This is that same file, only I'm opening it in oxy oxygen. And I've got my transforms are all set up and I'm, I'm making an improvement. So I want to select improvements. And I just run the transform in oxygen. It asks me where I want to save that file. And so I'm going to save it to Jira demo. And now it's, it's run, it's run the transform. But now if you look at it, it's got all this gobbledygook in here for the, um, for the uh, entity refs and so forth. In Oxygen, you can set up um, external tools and we've got a few set up and one of them is Jira Fixer. I just click Jira Fixer. It runs, it says that everything, it ended with exit code zero, which means it's good. And now I've got this information. Uh, I've got my Jira ticket, all my tickets in a topic in Ditto. So if I have a book ready to go, I can then um, save, I can gen generate PDF out of this. I can generate HTML or anything else that um, I am I'm set up to generate from my Jira. So I feel like I should kind of um, recap what, what we've gone through. Um, in, the, in, the, in the first place, release notes, there are a lot of po uh, processes in, 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 in the tech writing job and the publications job that can be improved on. And, you know, we're using computers. Let's let the computers do as much work as possible for us. Doing all of that work manually was unsustainable. And um, having, having it set up so that it can work um, in the machine saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of sanity. So I, I believe that technical writers and publications managers should always be looking at what they're doing and always looking for ways to improve on the process to save more time for doing the real work, which is writing the content. Now, another thing that we've seen is that JIRA is, it is what it is. It's flexible, um, it's, does some funny things, but it's it's pretty good. And so, with only two fields, we got a lot of a lot of benefit out of out of storing the release notes in there. Um, and and the fact that you can export the queries to XML means that you can convert them to Ditto. So there are ways to exploit that. Now another point is that Ditto is is not just about authoring pages. Ditto is also about process. You can use um, what when you have your content in a format like Ditto, you can take advantage of it in a lot of ways. You can do a lot of processing and, and make a lot happen. And, and that should always be in the back of your mind. What can we do? What more can we do? How can we improve the, the user's experience? How can we provide more content um, that's meaningful? You should always be thinking about that. And, and, and if you use a tool like Ditto, if you use a technology like Ditto, you should always be thinking about how to take advantage of it to the best. But on the other hand, you know, tools aren't everything. Um, you have to produce good content. Um, you got to write good, and there's no two ways about it. So I hope that everybody's survived this tour of XSLT and JIRA. And um, I'll leave it open to questions. 
and I'm going to let you maintain presenter control for now, just in case you need to flip back. So do we have any questions from the audience? See what's coming up. About how long did it take you to put together this process? So that's actually that's a pretty good question, and there are kind of two answers. It actually took a few years, <laughs> but um, it, it was a matter of discovering um, what we wanted and what we could do. Um, the initial the initial process uh, was up and running in uh, oh it maybe took me a day worth of playing around with XSLT to make it all work and and then what I did at that point was I opened it up in FrameMaker and I used FrameMaker to show and hide the different um, attributes the way FrameMaker does it. And then I used FrameMaker to save the the to generate the PDF. Um, we, you know, and and then somebody said, well, can we have links to the issues? And I said, oh yeah, sure, we can have links to the issues. And that was maybe a few months later. And then somebody else said, um, can we have cross references inside the issues? And so we've been improving all along. I think the the initial the the initial Push to actually put DITA inside a JIRA field and then save it out to be able to transform it, to, trans, to be able to generate a list of, of, of um, issues. That was maybe uh, eight hours of fiddling with XSLT and then maybe let's give it another day of, of um, testing it and making sure that it was reliable. Uh, let me have another question. And well, first, as a comment, it's an excellent presentation. This person is looking to do a similar workflow and want to kind of an overview of how the data content originally gets into the JIRA field. Ah. And if this is something that's difficult to explain, we can absolutely uh, have this person contact you via email if that's easier. No, no, it's absolutely easy to explain. You, okay. you go to the field in the JIRA database. You click edit, and then you start typing data content in it. It's as simple as that. That is pretty direct, more direct than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Any other questions? Uh, did you get resistance to adding the code to the JIRA fields? Um, no, I didn't. Um, I think probably for two reasons. One is that, um, you know, we have. A, a real startup mentality, and and um, you, you know, in 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 that mentality, um, in in a company, if you say, I can do something, it can save us all money, it can make things better for everybody, um, then then people say, we'll, we'll do it, and and so um, yeah, we, we had a lot of leeway in order to do that. I'd, I'd say, and and then once we had these two fields, we were free to do whatever we wanted with the fields. I'd say the, the resistance came um, when I said, yeah, we need, so so we, we initially said, well, we need to store the release note descriptions with each issue. And so somebody said, okay, well, we'll put a field in there for the release note um, description. And so that field was there and, and it was no problem. Then when I got the resistance was when I said, well, we need some metadata about these issues because we need to be able to sort them in different ways. We need to run different queries. We need to be able to add in this, this business of um, internal only or turbonomic only. And, and, and the people administering the, the JIRA database said, we don't want to add any more fields. Apparently, as you add fields, it, it impacts performance with JIRA, um, and, and they were practically religious about saying no new fields. But we did get them to add that second field. And with those two fields, then we can get a lot of work done. 
another question. Were you already adept with XSLT before you started this process or did those skills evolve with the process itself? Yeah, so I think the answer to that is yes. Um, although I wouldn't say I'm, I wouldn't say I'm adept even, you know, now, but um, I had used XSLT and I had performed other, you know, and, or implemented other transforms for other reasons. Um, I had copied other open source transforms and modified them. I, I had played around with XSLT, um, but at the same time, um, you're always learning things. The, the technique, um, let's see if I can find this. Um, there's a technique for finding this technique here for finding this custom field um, by name, okay? That for me was unimaginable when I began doing this, but um, Stack Overflow is a great place to go to ask questions. And you know, if you just Google, how do you do this with XSL? You'll find so many answers. And 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 so you should always be learning. I'm always learning. Um, and, and I learn quite a bit in, in the course of doing this particular project. Any other questions? We're also going to drop in that link I, t I mentioned earlier in the webcast, a link to a survey where we're going to gather feedback for this session. So please click that link in the chat panel and fill that out if you would. Also, you may have questions that are going to pop into your head later. Please send them either to the email that uh, Chris displayed earlier, or you can send them to us and we'll forward them. You can send them to experts at learningdata.com. And with that, Chris, thank you very much for a great demo and how data can work and what it can do for people to streamline work. This, this is very interesting. Well, I want to thank everybody for your time, for listening.